ever think about what it was like for Jesus growing up? Did he play rough and tumble games with his friends? Did he and his siblings squabble over small little things? Was Or was he the wise oldest brother keeping everyone in line with sage advice for everyone that was below him? Yeah, I say that as a wise older sister. <laughs> if I could time travel, one of the things that I would love to see would be what Jesus' daily life was like when he was around eight years old. I think it would be fascinating to see little kid Jesus running around playing, doing chores, learning carpentry, all that kind of stuff. I think it would just be fascinating to watch. I mean, there are a number of stories in the apocryphal writings about there about Jesus as a child, but only one story made it canonically into scripture. That is found in Luke 2, 41 to 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. When he was 12, year, 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival's over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him amongst their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have anxiously been searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? They, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. So I don't want to spend too much time this morning focusing on Jesus as a child. But my point, the point is, is that he had an earthly family. He had a mom, a dad, his siblings and cousins, people who grew up around and people who knew him since he was a small child. And sometimes the fact that you're growing up is the most difficult for the people around you to recognise. I mean, I say that um, experience growing up as a teen in a church and then eventually becoming a pastor in that same church. Some people still saw me as a shy young teen, teenager that I was, even though I was in my 30s at that time. But I get it. I mean, I know, I don't know if you've had the experience, it's like have, even though you're a fully-fledged adult, you've got your responsibilities, there are times when you're around, especially around family, be it your parents or siblings, that you revert to feeling like you're still that same old teenage rat bag. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we read the passages from Mark that we're going to be exploring today. In Mark 3, 20 to 21, um, Jesus said, Jesus entered the house and again a crowd gathered. So Jesus was in his 30s by now. And then a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. First thing I need to take place is that this takes place sometime during Jesus' ministry while he's travelling throughout Judea and Galilee. Um, but we don't know the exact location of this web of this house it is very likely that jesus's family who were in nazareth most likely had to travel to get to wherever this particular house was which means that of that news and gossip had reached them about what jesus was doing about what jesus was saying um so he was obviously being talked about in the area and his family was hearing what people were saying and as we can see from verse 21, they thought from the stories they were hearing that he's gone crazy, he's lost his mind, he's out of control, something like that. So maybe the stories were from the gossip were telling stories that were out of character from what they knew of Jesus as a child. Or maybe they were afraid for him, thinking he might be in danger because of what people were saying. I mean, it was no secret that the Jewish leaders were growing upset with Jesus and what he was teaching. So in this whole episode, I want to take a moment for us to consider Jesus' mother, to consider Mary. Mary knew that he was sent to her by God. 
to be the promised Messiah. I mean, I cannot imagine forgetting an angel showing up before her and telling her she was going to have a baby despite being a virgin. I mean, that's not something she would have easily forgotten. But at the same time, this was her son. She cared for him since birth. She taught him to walk. She taught, taught him to talk. She toilet trained him. She bathed him. She fed him. And so I guess 30 years later, it's hard to reconcile the fact that your child is actually the Messiah, that he may be doing something that you don't fully understand. There's got to be have some serious cognitive cognitive dissonance going on for her, not to mention fear. I mean, she'd heard that the Jewish leaders were not pleased with what Jesus had been saying. As a, as a mother, she must have been afraid for him, possibly because she could have remembered what Simeon said to her the day that he saw baby Jesus in the temple. We can read that in Luke um, chapter 2, verse 28 to 35. Simeon took him, baby Jesus, in his arm and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, for which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, the child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so, the th- so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword would pierce your own soul too. Just put yourself in Mary's point of view. This is her son who she loves dearly. And she's known this his whole life. But I can only imagine, you've got to kind of put that away while you're living day to day, um, being a mother of, of children and raising them. But from this story... One of the things we can take away is that family relationship is not a guarantee to be close to God or access to God. We can't claim that we are close to God or we understand God's heart just because our parents or our spouse has a close relationship with God. Or, you know, my family member is a pastor, my uncle is a missionary. We can't claim that glory for our own. We can't say, oh, because of what they do, I'm good, I'm good in the eyes of God. It's got to be our own relationship. John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13 says, Yet to all who received him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. So let's get back to the story in Mark. Further along, in Mark 3, um, verses 31 to 35, it says, that Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. So they travelled and they arrived at this house that Jesus was speaking at. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. There was a crowd sitting around him and they told him, your mothers and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mothers and brothers, he, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him. Here are my mothers and brothers. Whoever does, does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus' family, instead of being inside with him as he's doing this ministry, they actually ended up on the outside. They just were a part of the crowd that couldn't really get in. They were unable to even speak to him in person. I mean, have you ever been in a really tightly crowded space? probably pre-COVID, um, I have a few times. Usually at the opening of an event or things, when you're queuing up to wait to get inside, um, usually as time gets closer, the crowd's packing a bit tighter um, as people are waiting to get in and experience the event. And it's amazing how in these crowds, of usually strangers, how information goes through that crowd, almost a bit like Chinese whispers. Um, you know, if there's a delay, everyone hears about it in about five seconds. If another door's opened early, that, that information goes through as well, whether that information is accurate or not. But I, so I can imagine something similar happening when Jesus' family turned up. Whispers started through the crowd that was around outside and it made its way inside. Jesus' family's here. His mum's turned up. Oh, he must be in trouble if mum came. Something like that was going through the crowd. Even, even so... Jesus' response wasn't to go to them. In fact, his response was to say, my brothers and sisters are right here in front of me. 
seems a bit dismissive. Like, Jesus, don't you care that your mother and brother, brothers are here? They're arrived, they're wanting to speak to you? I mean, we can only really speculate what Jesus was thinking in that moment. The thing is that in this episode right here, Jesus reframed who he identified as family. He looked around him. He saw people that were following the will of God, that were yearning for a relationship with God, and he claimed them as his family. His, mother's and bro- his mother and brothers, no matter how good intentioned, and in that moment in time, were trying to call him away from what God had sent him to do. And unlike when he was a tw- 12 and still a child, now he was an adult. He was fully responsible for his own actions and his own choices. And he chose to submit and he chose to submit to the will of God instead of the wishes of his family. There was an important point that Jesus was making because in the midst of the people that listening to him were his disciples, the chosen twelve who had left their families, their work, their lives to leave everything behind and follow him. We know this because we're told in Matthew 4, verses 18 and 22. As Jesus was, was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called P- Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Once they left their nets and followed him, at once they left the nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called to them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and their father and followed him. This didn't mean that Jesus didn't love his family or want to see them, but in that moment, following the will of God was more important, even though they might not have been able to understand it right then. And putting God first can be hard. There are so many distractions in life and sometimes choosing to follow God means saying no to some good things. You know, that family holiday when God wants you to be at the Easter services to greet visitors and new people. Um, Sacrificing spare time reading a favourite novel or watching TV to spend time in prayer with God. Getting up early and missing out on some sleep so that you can have quiet time instead of sleeping in. That's definitely where I struggle. I like my sleeping. Putting God first does mean sacrifices, but they are worth it. Seeing people grow in faith as you journey along with them in life is one of the great benefits of being a part of God's family and being involved in his community of people in his church. What greater witness can you have to your own family and loved ones than that of faithful and sincere worship and obedience to God. In the case of Jesus' family, despite what their movements were on this particular day, we know that ultimately that they come to understand the truth about who Jesus is, what he came to do, and they chose, They also chose to obey, follow him and follow God. Because we are told in Acts 2, 2 um, verse 12 to 14, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill they called Mount Olives at a Sabbath day walk from the city. Then when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. They all joined constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Can you imagine it? His his mother, his brothers, they chose to worship him and praise him. They grew up with him. They knew they knew him better than anyone else. And they but they the revelation came to them. They understood his purpose. So what is the point of this episode that Mark tells us? Is it to make Jesus' family look bad because they thought he was crazy? Is it, was it, or was it to tell us that we need to completely ignore our own earthly family and do whatever we want regardless of their thoughts and feelings? No. No matter how much that last point may be tempting. 
we are actually called to honour, love and care for our families in obedience to God. <clears throat> God loves family. He created, he created it. And the fact is that when we follow God first, we're actually able to gain a whole new family, a community through which we do life together, which I think is pretty awesome. As we conclude, I just want to leave with one final verse. It's from Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2.19. He says, You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. We are all part of God's family. We are Jesus' brothers and sisters. What are you going to do with that? We're going to go into a bit of response time. On the screen is going to be some questions. Um, like, Do your family and friends draw you closer to God? Is there something that is getting away of you putting God first? It may be family, maybe friends, maybe something else entirely. How does being a part of God's family make you feel? And how can you help encourage your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in their journey with God? We're going to take a few moments to reflect on these questions or just reflect on anything God has been speaking to you throughout the service. You can write down your notes or your prayer points on the response cards that are on your seat. Um, seat next to you or for those of you that are joining us by Zoom um, the, the options to connect with us is on the screen as well so take care and I'm going to ask David to put some music on thanks you are here
Heavenly Father, I thank you that you chose us, that you call us child, that you call us your children, and that we are a part of your family. Let us pray this week as, as we go about that we remember that we are a child of God and that no matter what's going on in our world, we have a family right here. In your name, amen. So during this final song, the offering is going to be collected and you can put your response cards and pencils and stuff back in, in the dishes as they go around as well. Thanks. <laughs>